Final presentation is from Bruce Chassie. Uh, people at the University of Illinois know who Bruce is, but uh, Bruce is a professor emeritus of food safety and professor emeritus of nutritional sciences in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. And his uh, presentation will be public acceptance of science, technology, and GMOs, barriers and implications for food security. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to you all. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for an incredibly educational meeting and a chance to meet and talk with many of you. Um, as the last speaker, though, I had some special concerns. Um, uh, well, and I had even more when the thunder and lightning started out here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm glad to see that a lot, a lot of you stayed, um, but I took the chance. I wasn't willing to take the chance, so I, I kind of packed the house a little bit, and I'd like to introduce a couple of people, my son Lee and grandsons Trent um, and uh, Grant. Um, live in Champaign, even though I left Champaign, and I figured that would add a little audience on the right side over here. Um, but also, they've never heard me talk. And then I realized that they, very much like my new grandson, Ori, um, who you're seeing here in Seattle at his first visit to a restaurant, um, that, that all of these children and grandchildren are going to see 9 or 11 billion people. They're going to live through what we're, we have been talking about for the last few days. And I guess, if nothing else, I wanted them to know that we're aware of the world we're leaving them, and we want to change it for the better. And I was, I've been very heartened by what I've heard so far at this meeting, and I hope you have too. Um, one of the things that makes me heartened is, is the recognition that we have actually some common ground here. I think most of us agree that whether we want to call it an entitlement, de jure, or de facto, that people really do have a right to food. It's in the United Nations Charter. Um, and, and that we're going to have to improve access to food, and that we need to be more sustainable, that we face some complex problems uh, and major challenges, and that we're going to need a lot more research to figure this out, but at least we're talking, and clearly we're doing this all around the world. Um, sustainability is finally being put in the sunlight. So that gives me cause for the same kind of guarded optimism that many of the other speakers um, have um, shared with us. On the other hand, I have to say, um, while we have had some optimism, uh, last night I think Richard um, Feinberg uh, used the expression optimistic doom and gloom. Um, I think we've had a little of that. I think my job is to be a little cynical today, or at least raise a couple red flags about a couple things that I think we need to be thinking about. Uh, so I want to talk, even though I'm not a psychologist or a social scientist, a little bit about the psychology of risk perception and risk communication, which as a food safety person I get to do, um, risk communication to people who are very concerned very often. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what consumers think about GMOs because that's what I was asked to do. And there's some spillover into what people think about science and technology in general. And close with some comments about how we deal with um, narratives, possibly even myths, um, that are not lining up very well with what the facts and evidence tell us. Uh, I'm not going to prognosticate about what the implications of all of this are for the future because like Loki, Lo Yogi Berra told us, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Having thought about this, I realized that I understood what the number one problem is um, in this area, and it's us. And cartoonist Walt Kelly put it in the, in the words of Pogo, the cartoon character, we've met the enemy and he is us. And part of it is because of the way we think about risk. Another part, which I'm not going to talk about, is the way we think about change. But we've dealt with that because we've talked a little bit about changing diets and how hard that is. Our risk perception is not very scientific. In fact, it's not rational. It's not quantitative. We are disproportionately fearful of things that are new, that we don't understand, that we can't control, and about which there is uncertainty. And the list is actually about 12 more items than that. There's a good article on um, consumer concerns, uh, risk fears, uh, related to genetic modified foods uh, that I've given you the link for here. Please feel free to email me if you want any of the links or references from this, this talk, but it should be uh, posted, I guess, within a week on the web so you can access it. Um, there are many other good explanations of food safety risk perception. A lot of it comes from who we are and how we evolved. 
We're basically storytellers. We live by an oral tradition historically, and we believe a good narrative, even when the facts should be telling us otherwise. Another thing that we um, certainly are is uh, easily provoked by visual stimuli, uh, evocative stimuli. That's because we used our eyes and ears to protect ourselves from risks very long ago. There's not a lot of intellectual activity uh, that goes into risk perception when we're threatened. Um, and some of the people that oppose genetically modified foods, and you know there are lots of things out there on the web, have some great evocative images. Frankenstein is another one. Uh, corn ears, you know. The, the images are all designed to trigger a very, very deep brain response uh, that this is yuck that you're looking at. Somebody's put fish genes in your tomatoes. Um, Another thing about us is that we seek pure confirmation in the face of risk. Kahan has called it cultural cognition. I call it their safety in numbers. We want to do what our peers are doing, and we feel a whole lot better if it's a shared perception. One of the weaknesses we have, many of us are academics, is that we believe that if we just explain things to people, they're going to feel better about it. And that's what we've tried to do with biotechnology and a lot of other things. Well, the fact is that diffusion model of information, or what you might call the deficit of information model, doesn't work very well on risk. What does work well on risk actually turns out to be reassurance from someone you trust and believe in, and a good story, a story you can buy into. I would argue, and I will later on again, that the people who oppose many technologies, many kinds of changes, many kinds of businesses, who are in the professional advocacy business, have learned to tell a good story. And sadly, we haven't. Even though, as you heard in the last several days, there are some great stories to tell. Another thing that we constantly hear in our society is bickering now back and forth about people who are science deniers. Um, like climate change deniers, and certainly they existed. We've got vaccine deniers, GMO deniers, and liberals accuse conservatives of being science deniers, and conservatives accuse liberals, and it just depends upon what the issue is. This is like totally counterproductive. First of all, nobody likes to be called a name, and secondly, none of us really are science deniers or, or are anti-science. And in fact, what little research has been done shows that there's little difference across the political spectrum in science literacy or respect for science. Um, what does happen is that um, many of us do deny clear science. Um, and I, like I say, climate change is just a great example. Uh, but it has to do with the strength of some beliefs that we hold that don't allow us to accept that science. We have bought into a particular narrative. We have, are now selecting the information uh, that we will listen to. We reject information that is contradictory to our value system beliefs or the model, the myth we bought into. And in fact, contradictory information can even confirm our belief. Uh, we, we, we sort of get find it rigid and just say, no, now I'm just not going to be questioned. That's why you've got people like this, uh, two typical Americans who aren't going to eat genetically modified foods because they could be unhealthy. And Peter Sandman remarked that the risks that kill people and the risks that upset people are completely different. So get over it. This is an emotional business when we talk about risk. How do we make decisions about, about anything, especially risks? Well, uh, Tamar Haspel, who writes for the New York Times and, and uh, is a columnist, gave a talk this summer that I heard that I thought she sort of had the most concise way of putting this. We think we look at facts and come to conclusions. But every time we do that, we forget that there's a big elephant in the room with us. And that big elephant is all of these beliefs, perceptions, life experiences, and so on and so forth. And even scientists who think they're very rational do this about the experiments they choose to do, how they choose to interpret their evidence and the conclusions that they come to are culture driven. Moreover, when they get outside of science, they're just like the rest, or their particular area of expertise, they're just like the rest of us. They've got a huge elephant in the room that controls whether they're a vaccine denier or, or, or you know, whatever else it is. In fact, um, the way we all think about things is that we have two decision making systems. The first one makes snap judgments. We know right at the very beginning what's happening or what's going to happen or what we should do. 
System two kicks in after we've made up our decision, sometimes even after we've acted on that decision, and system two explains to the world why system one was right. We intellectualize what we concluded. Um, and again, I, there's a whole literature on this. I'd be happy to share references with you um, after the talk. So to turn to the topic, I was asked to address uh, what do consumers think of um, foods produced using biotechnology. Well, I've already made reference to the fact, and several others have, that there's a lot of misinformation out there that's scaring the heck out of consumers, and many people claim to talk for consumers about what we should do about foods produced using biotechnology. Um, there are, one of the ways they do that is they take polls or surveys and they say that 90% of people want GM foods labeled, or 70% of Americans say they're afraid of GM foods or don't you know, want GM foods. And you can look and see that there are any number of polls like that. Uh, in fact, Lusk um, reviewed them in this article in 2011. So I really looked around to find some good information about what would really tell, inform us about what consumers are thinking. And um, you have to recognize the food industry's had a lot of experience with this, and, and I think many other industries. What people tell you in a poll or survey very often doesn't reflect what they really go out and choose or buy or even what they believe. So you have to be very careful how you sample public opinion. The International Food Information Council, or IFIC in Washington, D.C., has been conducting surveys in nutrition and food perceptions of consumers for at least the last 10 or 12 years. They do it um, biennially. And they have developed a, a good methodology. They don't ask consumers leading questions that lead them to the answer. Um, they're very careful about the research methods. They have a thousand or more respondents that are, represent a demographic cross-section. So I'm gonna use their data. You can download and look at the entire study. And they have a number of other studies that are very interesting in this area uh, on the IFIC webpage. Uh, so I highly recommend what they have done. Um, there's some good news here and there's some bad news here for uh, biotechnology. First of all, if you ask people what their impressions are of uh, food biotechnology, what you'll see is that um, the number of people who are not favorably impressed is more or less the same as the number of people who are favorably impressed. And a lot of people don't have an opinion and in fact they say they don't really know very much about um, biotechnology. Favorable impressions were going up uh, in 2012, and that's statistically significant difference, uh, but they've actually gone down again to where they were before, and the number of people who have an unfavorable impression has increased. I think there are two reasons for this that I'm going to talk about one of them a little bit, uh, the, the, but um, not the other one. Um, I don't, just because of time. Uh, one reason for it is that there have been a number of state initiatives to ma have mandatory labeling of GM that have resulted in campaigns, the news about which has been carried nationally repeatedly, and the campaigns have been very negative about GM foods, but it's put it more into the mainstream that made people more conscious of it. So we've made some people who were obviously sitting in the middle before because they're not counted, they've moved into the, I'm, I'm not sure I like this GM business. Uh, but the news isn't all bad either. Uh, if you ask people what are their most favored uses of biotechnology, now we're not asking them is it good or bad, but what do you like, you can see that a very high percentage rank reducing pesticide application, keeping food prices stable, or feeding undernourished people uh, as their, their top priorities. And there are, in fact, a number of other things that they mention as good uses of this technology. It's almost hard to, it's a little schizo if you think about it. There aren't a lot of people that approve of it, but they think it's, a lot of people think it's good for doing these things. In addition, they ask, it, what GM foods would you want to consume? And again, you get a, a very high percentage, two thirds to three quarters of, of the, of the um, survey group uh, will we'll eat healthier foods, like with omega-3 oils, uh, low carcinogens, low pesticides, enhanced nutrition. I mean, there, there is a, a kind of a favorable impression uh, that we could, in fact, improve foods using this technology. I want to um, turn to labeling specifically, because I just mentioned it. Labeling is a contentious issue right now, and, and IFIC has been surveying labeling attitudes for, as I said, about 12 years. And they ask a question that's completely 
non-leading. And that question is, is there anything that isn't today on a food label that you think or you, you would like to have on a food label? And that would be informative to you. Consistently over the years, 1% of consumers have said they want GMOs labeled. This year, with all the hoopla about um, mandatory labeling campaigns, that number has moved up to 4%. So this is not a very top of mind issue for most people. It's important to the industry, we've had it mentioned before, simply because it will cost a great deal of money. It will not provide consumers any choice. Consumers have choice now. Whole Foods will be GM free within a couple of years. Uh, there are over 20,000 products whose SKOs are listed, SKUs are listed on a website that are GM free. The non-GMO pro, non product has endorsed them as GM free. And organic food is GM free. So if consumers want to eat GM free, they can. The leaders of the, of the labeling GM project have said very specifically and very publicly, their purpose is to use mandatory labels as a way to scare producers and suppliers and consumers out of using GM products and to get GM products out of the marketplace completely. That's their stated political motive. So you have to recognize what's going on here. If you explain the FDA labeling policy, which means no mandatory labels for GM foods to American consumers, it turns out the great majority of them, about two thirds, say yeah, they approve of that policy and they only change even when you bring up the subject of labeling, is that in this last year about, which is a statistically significant difference, oh no, oh, help. Uh, um, so I, there was a slide up there that said that there is a statistically significant difference um, just this year because of these labeling campaigns, about another 5% uh, say that they don't approve of the FDA policy. Uh, so, good news and bad news uh, for those of you who like surveys. I like to very quickly, uh, and I'm going to mostly skip over this, talk about what the science says. Other speakers, uh, uh, Professor uh, Silberman, uh, for one, this morning, uh, covered uh, the safety issue. So I'm going to skip over the slides that I had in, I had in here, except to pick off one um, comment, and that is, is that conventional breeding of all kinds uh, have now been recognized to produce more unintended changes than transgene insertion. And I was going to show you some evidence for that, but we don't, really don't have time for it. And that's based on a literature survey of proteomic, transcriptomic, metabolomic um, profiling of GM and non-GM counterparts. So I would say this, if you, any of you out there happen to believe that uh, GMOs aren't as safe as any other food or their comparable counterpart, uh, I think you need to go back in the room and talk to your elephant. And if you can't get it straight with your elephant, feel free to contact me. This is like totally not a science issue. Whatever you believe. And I realize I'm contradicting some of your beliefs. Uh, so there's something that's driving and amplifying consumer concerns about biotechnology applied to agriculture that I want to talk about. And that's the other reason that, that we're seeing some trend downward that I said I'd talk about. There's an advocacy industry in this country that's at least 500 companies strong operating in the area of food, nutrition, agriculture, you know, and all of that. And collectively, these 500 organizations ha have about a two or greater billion dollar income with which to deliver programming and um, Funding recently has changed from climate change advocacy, which most of us would say was a good thing that they were advocating for climate change, to actually anti-GM and anti-pesticide advocacy. The amount of funding overall has gone up, and there is an internationally coordinated program to try to get GMOs and pesticides out of the market. And that's the business of the advocacy industry. They are good at doing it. They are professional. Um, they understand that we worry first about health and safety, we then worry about environmental, and then we worry about socioeconomic issues, and um, they, t they develop allegories or stories or myths or narratives that we can relate to. All these stories tend to have villains, victims, and heroes. Uh, you can read more about it in uh, Jay Byrne's article, uh, but this is a business. And it's actually being used in some very cynical ways, which one of which I'll give you an example of in a moment. 
This, this is a problem that, that many of us face. Um, the paper just came out in PNAS that looked at uh, how you gain trust when communicating to people, um, and to motivated audiences anyway. And uh, what turned out was that while we are considered, and I say we meaning engineers and scientists and uh, researchers, we're considered very competent. We're kind of down the scale when it comes to how people feel about our warmth. Um, and that causes them not to trust us as much. Um, beyond that, the advocacy industry ha has found a, a really new market that's really quite cute. Um, I recently uh, commissioned for my website a report on organic marketing and what is driving the growth of organic marketing, uh, of organic sales, pardon me, and why are consumers buying it? You'd like to think they're buying it because it's more sustainable. That turns out not to be true, even though everybody says it. Remember, the elephant tells them what to say. It turns out they're all afraid of pesticides and GMOs and all of that. You can download this rather lengthy report and we provide a lot of evidence for uh, what I just asserted. And what the new marketing paradigm is for some companies, there are organic producers who hate this paradigm and they don't want to advertise organic this way. They want to advertise it by its strengths and, and you know, the good stuff about it. So I'm not going to paint all of organic with the same brush here, but what's happening is a good part of the industry is funding advocacy groups who then spread fear about things like pesticides or GMOs and then that makes consumers, God, I did it again. This is a dangerous remote control. That makes consumers, of course, buy organic or non-GM or non-pesticide containing products. Okay, so um, not the point of today's talk, but it's a really interesting model. Um, maybe in questioning, if you want an example of it, I can give you an example of it. I want to talk about another kind of myth. And, and yeah, that's what I'll do. I'm going to talk about another kind of myth um, or, or story um, and, and then try to wrap this up. So you've heard many times that we should adopt a village-centered agroecological approach to agriculture, that it'll be better for us. And, and you know, in this story, chemical fertilizers, industrial agriculture, uh, intensification, and GMOs are actually part of the problem rather than the solution. And we, and we have this narrative that small farmers using renewable local resources will bring us back to the golden age of harmony when we weren't trashing the world with agriculture. Well, we didn't have seven billion people then either, and we lived to be about 35, um, but that's neither here nor there. Well, I disagree with this, but, but I'm gonna tell you right off, I think there are places where that myth is appropriate. We've gotta stop saying, gotta do it this way, gotta do it that way, my way's the right way, and recognize this is a very varied world with very varied agroecosystems, and we have to do what's appropriate in a particular place. So don't take this, again, as a trashing of this myth, but an example of a myth that people, that appeals to people. It even appeals to me, to be honest. Some, some data, oh yeah, I forgot I threw this in here. Actually, the latest issue of The Ecologist uh, had a statement from a newly appointed uh, UN uh, representative who, uh, working at FAO who said, only small farmers and agroecology can feed the world. So. This is definitely going around. Now that's my timer saying to finish up. So let me, oh, hush. Um, let, me, let me share with you a couple pet peeves with a lot of thinking that goes into many of these kinds of myths. Um, I think a lot of them don't do a, a system balance or a life cycle analysis that counts all the inputs and all the consequences and all the indirect effects and the trade-offs that are involved in making these choices. They often use antidotes, which are not data, and a bunch of antidotes isn't evidence for something. They tend to overgeneralize beyond the case that they're dealing with. They really don't do the math, and I'm gonna show you an example of doing the math. And they don't demonstrate scalability. And by scalability, I don't mean intensification or enlargement. We had a great example by Raj just now of how you could scale something down to a small farm as opposed to you know, always being big. You have to think about the scale. By the way, if you wanna talk about the myth of, of, of locavorism, uh, I, I would highly recommend the locavorous dilemma. Um, okay, so the organic industry claims that its methods are sustainable. And we've just heard this, I'm gonna repeat it. Organic agriculture in this country is actually practiced by real yields, according to the USDA, produces 60% as much food per acre as conventional agriculture. I'm sorry, that's not sustainable. They have to fix that. Uh, 
we talked about nitrogen. We, we had a reference, I think maybe an, an, Andrew Refkin, the very first night, talked about smell and the wonderful work that he's done on nitrogen. I know Steve Long actually referred to the fact that maybe 60 or 70 percent of all the nitrogen we fertilize things with comes from the Haber-Bosch process. But of course that uses energy, as Richard pointed out. If we run out of petroleum, how are we going to make you know, nitrogen. Well, one thing that we might do is, of course, put cows out in the field and make manure because that's how it's done in agroecological agriculture. And if you assume the highest yields and give this the absolutely best case, if you look at the corn crop in the United States, it occupies an area about the size of New Mexico. Okay? And then if you make some assumptions about how many cows it takes per acre to make the right amount of nitrogen, you multiply it through you end up with nine states having to be converted to pasture and to a manure gathering operation in order to have enough nitrogen to raise just the corn crop in the United States. I'll sort of leave you with this thought. That would be 288 million cows, more than we have now, and that would emit a lot of very potent greenhouse gas. But on the other hand, we've heard that we have to switch to a more vegetarian diet, and I certainly think that would be healthier, and I agree with that. But we wouldn't have to if we had all these cows out there pasturing over nine states. So maybe we solve, solve one problem. Let me, let, me, let me close with some thoughts on effective communication. Understand your audience and recognize that true believers seldom convert but they're the people you want to talk to because they're the ones who disagree with you who will have the best insights into how you can communicate to people um, who aren't so convinced as they are. You better be impartial, fair, inclusive, and transparent. Tell it as it is. I've already said it, scientists and researchers need to get some warmth. And one of the ways to do that is tell stories about people. I'll make a confession right now. Do you remember how I started this talk? I showed you a picture of my grandchild. I'm sorry, that was deliberate. But you, you thought about me differently because I showed you that picture. Um, offer a way to work together to meet the challenge. Let's depolarize this and say, uh, I respect you, I respect what you're thinking. Let's see how we can take what you're thinking and what I'm thinking and we can put that together to make some progress. Unfortunately, we're not there on a lot of these issues first, but it turns out the first presentation that people hear about an issue tends to frame and control their perceptions forever. It takes a long time to turn those perceptions into beliefs, so you've still got time. Most Americans haven't made up their mind about the technology I'm talking about today, but you're, you're, if you're out there first and framing, people's perceptions, that's the best place to be, and we're talking about a lot of new technologies that you just might want to think about, spending more of your time communicating with the public and the media and policymakers and less of your time in the laboratory and writing papers. I'm going to conclude that, yeah, it's great that we have a lot of shared values here. I hope I've convinced you that GM technology is just a tool that might help solve some of our problems. It's not going to feed the world. It's just a tool that we breed better plants with. Get over it. Uh, that we, I hope I've convinced you we need to be rational, inclusive, and agnostic about solutions. But on the other hand, we have to understand that people aren't rational about risks. We just have to find a way to deal with that. I don't think ideology ever solves problems, maybe seldom solves problems. So I would hope that we've all learned from this meeting, and we've seen elegant examples of it, that we better do the math before we form strong beliefs about what will work rather than afterwards. I would leave you with the biggest challenge in the future because there's so much concern about consumers and, and there's, there's a stifling of, of development in this area and there are really overly strict regulations that what we really need to work on is talking to those advocacy groups. We've heard reference to the fact that Greenpeace has done some really good things in other arenas. They're, they're one of the strongest uh, anti-GMO groups that's around there. So what we really need to do is turn that anti-sentiment that they have into buy-in and then advocacy for the kinds of technologies that we all agree will help move us forward on some of the challenges that we faced. Close, closing cartoon is 
It's really important for us, and I don't think I need to tell researchers and academics this, to understand the nature of your problem and the challenges if you're not going to solve it, if you really don't understand the causes and what it's all about. And that's the appeal for needing to do more research. I'm going to close with a couple of cavemen who are sitting there saying, you know, something's just not right. Our air is clean, our water's pure, we get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. They obviously don't understand the problem, do they? Thanks for your time. I was worried about a lightning bolt, actually. I was wondering, do you think that um, scientists who are advocating for GMOs would benefit from maybe acknowledging more of, you hear a lot about the pros of GMOs when you hear scientists talking about GMOs and how they're good for society, but you don't often hear about, it's actually more nuanced than that, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but there are certain risks, as there are risks associated with any technology, and do you think that scientists would be more effective at winning over the general public if they were more willing to acknowledge that there are certain risks associated with every, you know, every technology that's coming out and actually be more willing to talk about those things? Um, I guess I'll just leave it there. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. And in fact, it's, it's kind of on the list here. Um, I have another list like this that, that says, at, I took it off for brevity, because this is too long, which is acknowledge risks. Um, it is true that every new technology has risks. Uh, as we heard this morning uh, in Professor Silberman's talk, there are other risks that are even bigger, and we have to balance the risks and trade-offs. And I, I totally agree with you that that's a discussion that you have to have. And notice point two, impartially, fairly, objectively, inclusively, and transparently. Um, it's very important. I think, and, and now we're going to get over into my elephant and my opinions. I, ha I have watched this for about 15 years, and I think that a lot of the claimed risks of GM that the public is concerned about are simply falsehoods that have been propagated deliberately by people who know better. Very often when you talk to them in private, I'm talking about the advocacy group representatives, they admit it, but they say, this is my job. Uh, and, and I think it's really unethical. And, and it, it, it's very hard to tell their myths for them. And they do such a good job of putting those myths out everywhere. Many of us, like myself, have got to the point where we don't spend a lot of time talking about their myths. However, the point you're making is very key because that you have to separate from understanding what's bothering people and engaging people and saying, ah, I, I, I get it. I know why you're worried about that. I, and this certainly is a new technology. But what most people don't know is the, the number of years we have spent trying to make sure that it's as safe as any other food. No food's 100% safe. I'm about to come out with a report, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to get it pu published in the peer-reviewed press, that shows that organic foods are recalled for, bio for microbiological contamination at a rate four to eight times that of conventional foods. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the reaction to that is. Okay, There's a lot people don't know about food risks. Other questions? And by the way, if you don't believe me about the recalls, go, go to the database of recalls that CDC has and look at them. They're 20, 30, 40% organic, even though it's only 4% of the industry. Hey, uh, I just wanted to mention, maybe you can speak to it, um, the concept of if we were truly rational, do you think that there could be a GMO organic? Oh, I think, yeah. The, I, this is just a great question. First of all, I don't think we're ever going to be truly rational. That's not human nature. Uh, but all of us working together, I mean, that's what peer review is about. That's what going to a scientific meeting and getting beat up about you know, is all about, is we do have mechanisms to force us all onto some common rational ground. And when it comes to uh, GMOs, when the National Organic uh, Standards were being set at the USDA, they put organic and GMO together. 25% of organic growers, this is my actual survey for what it's worth, 
Um, 25% wanted GM, 25% said if it was in there they'd use it, 25% were opposed to it and said it shouldn't be in there, it's a distinguishing feature of our agriculture, and 25% said no way. And they really complained a lot and it was taken out. I think organic and GM are a better fit than some of the other things we do in, in agriculture. Uh, it, it's, Rachel Carson said we should use biological solutions and stop using chemical solutions. What is genetic engineering other than a biological solution for a biological problem? I mean, I think the environmental movement just plain got it wrong. And, and we need to resolve that and just move on because it's actually distracting us from a much more important conversation that we need to be having. Great. Final questions? Good enough. Uh, let me uh, thank all three representatives. Illinois.